Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for being here. And with the permission of the jury, I'm going to start my talk, uh, which is uh, my name is Hamid Purkhorsandi. And uh, my talk is going to be the, the results of my PhD work that I did here at Serej and Ex Marseille University. So, my work was in the field of meteoritics, which is the science of studying meteorites. And the topic of my work in general is meteorites from Iran and hot deserts, and this work has been done under the supervision of Professor Pierre Rochet. Uh, based on the structure of the thesis, here uh, I, I'll give some uh, information about the meteorites in general, and then about the methodology of the work that I've done here at, during this study. The other part is going to be the meteorites from hot deserts, and particularly from the Iranian deserts. The other part, I'm going to talk about the weathering of meteorites on terrestrial environment on Earth. And it will be followed by studying a unique meteorite from hot desert collections that I will discuss about the meteorite from the Atacama Desert. The other section is going to be describing two meteorite falls from Iran, from Enina Moshampa. And at the end, I'll give I talk about the conclusions and uh, perspectives of this study. Uh, about what is a meteorite? Actually, uh, when you see this video, it's showing a meteor, which is a uh, luminous phenomenon in the sky that we see when a cosmic body it enters the Earth's atmosphere, and because of its high high uh, speed, which is in the uh, orders of tens of kilometers per second, it starts to burn the excited atmosphere and also the body itself. So at the end, if the body is big enough, we have a sample which falls on Earth, and it's called as a meteorite. So it's a space rock which falls to Earth, it's a meteorite. And this phenomenon is called the meteor that we see in the sky. About their origin, uh, here uh, is a map which is showing the inner solar system particularly. We have the Jupiter, which is uh, the, the, the biggest planet in our solar system. We have the Mars, Earth, and next to it, we have the Moon, and inner side we have Venus and, and Mercury. And if you look to this area, which is the, the area between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter, we have an area which is full of uh, uh, objects in, in tens of kilometers to hundreds of tens of kilometers in size, which are called asteroids. And the majority of the meteorites they are coming from this area. Asteroids, indeed, they are the leftovers of the formation of the solar system, and they are giving us access to the oldest material in our solar system. Besides the meteorites from the asteroids, also we have some meteorites which are originating from the planet Mars and also from our, our satellite, the Moon. Why meteorites are important? Because, as I told you, for instance, in the case of the meteorites from asteroids, they are giving us information about the formation of the solar system because they are the oldest material available for study. And by looking to these meteorites, we can gain insights into how the solar system has formed. Besides this, since when the planets they were forming, they were small grains, and then they become bigger and bigger. And at the end, they form bigger objects. By studying meteorites, we can learn about the formation and evolution of planets in our solar system. In addition, some groups of meteorites they are they have organic matter and also water inside them. And for the people who are interested to work on the origin of life in our Earth and also the origin of life, uh, origin of water in our solar system, meteorites are important. Besides that, because these uh, meteorites are the only samples that we have from, except the samples from the moon, 
we, they are the only material that we have from, for instance, the Mars or the asteroids because the, the, in order to get samples, we need to do space missions, which are very technically very difficult and also economically they are very expensive. So meteoroids are very important because nature gives them to us as free objects from these uh, uh, asteroids and the Mars and other bigger objects. And how to get them, since they are very important, so there are two ways to have access to meteorites. One of them, as we saw in the early uh, video, is when we see a meteor in the sky, and at the end, the meteorites which are, which are being collected, it is one of the best ways to have access to meteorites, because the meteorites that we have them for, from fall meteorites, they are very fresh. So these kind of meteorites which are related to the, the, the observed meteors, they are called fall meteorites, and they are very important because the fact is that the number of these meteorites that we have in our collections, it's not very much. It's like less than 1,200 meteorites in all collections that we have. And there is another way of collecting meteorites and having access to meteorites. When these meteorites, they fall to, extra, to terrestrial environment, uh, because they are coming from an area which the, the activity of, of weathering agents, for instance, flute water, is very low or it doesn't exist. So meteorites, when they fall to Earth, because uh, most of them, they have high amounts of iron inside, they start to get better than they start to get altered. But in areas in Earth, we have the, the well, all meteorites that they fall, they start to get better during the time. And in areas on Earth that the rate of weathering is low, so there is a high chance of going there and finding high numbers of meteorites. For instance, if we go around here uh, and we find a meteorite in the forest, a rusted meteorite, it is called the found meteorite. And if we go to desertic areas, there are plenty of found meteorites because there are more uh, drier areas, so the rate of weathering is so low. That's why we go to deserts to collect meteorites. So these are the pictures showing uh, the, the, the members of Serej team looking for meteorites in Atacama Desert very recent and also in Antarctica again very recently. And find meteorites, they are one of the they are the biggest source of meteorites that we have. The the number of fine meteorites is much uh, higher. So they are very important in our studies and for the people who are working on the formation of solar system and all the other things that we talked about. So since the, the study, the, the focus of this study was on the find meteorite. So here we talked that why meteorites from desert, uh, specifically from hot deserts, they are very important. Because they are giving us access to very unique meteorites. We go there, we go to deserts, and we can have the opportunity of finding very unique meteorites that are giving us access to very unique information about the solar system. Besides that, by collecting meteorites from different desertic areas and by doing the dating when they have fallen to Earth, we can learn about the flux of extraterrestrial matter to Earth to see that does it change during the time, does the composition of matter which fell to Earth, does it change during the time, or if the amount of material which fell to Earth, does it change during the time or not. And besides that, when we study the meteorites from desertic areas and we study their terrestrial weathering, since the regime of weathering, it might be different in different regions, so we can learn about the climate of the area during times. By looking to the map of the uh, nonpolar arid lands on, on Earth, we see that there are very interesting, uh, uh, potentially very interesting areas for looking for meteorites, and there have been high numbers of meteorites being found in desertic areas. And the focus of this study was in this area in the Middle East in Iran, and which is one of the driest countries in the area. More than 50 of the country is arid to uh, semi-arid. And if we look to this map, this map is showing the number of meteorites from different areas of Earth which have been uh, classified. And you see that the desertic areas that I showed you in the, in the previous figure, for instance, here, the Atacama Desert, we have high numbers of meteorites. The southwest United States, again, Australian deserts, northwest Africa, and the Sahara Desert, they have been plenty of meteorites being found here, and also from the uh, Arabian Peninsula. So it, it, it shows that desertic areas, they are good sources of meteorites. And by going to these places and finding new desertic areas, which are potentially good places for preservation of meteorites, we have more access to more meteorites for more study. So as I told you, the focus of this study was in Iran. 
This map is showing the topographic map of Iran. Uh, as you can see here, we have uh, Zagros and Alborz Mountains, and then we have some depressions in the country. Uh, this is the Great Kavir Desert. And in this part of the country, in the, in the east to southwest of the country, we have a big depression, which is called Lut Desert. And here was the area that we were interested to look for meteorites and to study the meteorites from this area. In the topographic map of Lut Desert, we can see that it's a depression, so here we have two fault systems in this side and in this side, which are making this a desert uh, geomorphologically and also by climate means very, very unique area and very dry area, very hot area, which makes it potentially good for meteorites. So we started this project by, by, by checking that if there are uh, enough meteorites in this area or not, that I'll give the results in the, in the other parts of this talk. But for that, I'm going to uh, uh, give information about the methodology of this work and also the meteorite classification in general. So this chart is showing uh, meteorite classification. So here we see undifferentiated meteorites and differentiated meteorites. In general, in the early solar system, we had uh, two, two types of objects which formed. Some of them which were big enough they, they started to, their, their internal uh, uh, temperature was high enough that they started to experience melting and fractionation like Earth. And also at, in the other side, we had undifferentiated bodies, which were small objects, and they, they, were not, uh, they didn't experience high temperature and uh, lots of changes. So these matter, the meteorites which are coming from undifferentiated bodies, they are very primitive. But the samples that are coming from differentiated uh, bodies, the, these meteorites, they, they, have been cha they have changed during the, the early solar system. If we look to the we see that the majority of the meteorites that we have are chondritic meteorites, which uh, are the most primitive meteorites in our collection. And among meteorites, chondritic meteorites, the, the, the majority of them are ordinary chondrites, which are in three main groups that I'll so the methodology of this study, in the beginning, it was meteorite hunting, going for different deserts to look for meteorites, and particularly Lut Desert again. So here it's showing uh, uh, our recent trip to the Atacama Desert, so looking the meteorites in the field, and then bringing back to the lab, doing microscopic studies. This figure is showing a meteorite, a chondritic meteorite. So you see uh, these objects that are called chondrules, which are the among the first solid objects which formed in the solar nebula. So this is a chondritic meteorite from the Lut Desert. First, we did the petrography observation of meteorite, or if it's an undifferentiated meteorite. The other step for classification of a meteorite is to do magnetic uh, measurements. In this case, this is a plot which is showing the magnetic classification of ordinary chondrites. Here, we have the magnetic susceptibility, which is dependent on the, the amount of the magnetic minerals in a meteorite. So this red curve is showing ordinary chondrites, which have higher amount of metal inside them, so more magnetic susceptibility, and the other ones as well. So these reds are called H chondrites, L chondrites, and LL chondrites. So magnetic measurements was the other step to classify meteorite. The other way which is done to classify meteorite is to, to measure, the, to, to analyze the mineral chemistry of a meteorite, and in, and in particularly the, the chemistry of olivine and pyroxene. So this graph is showing the olivine and pyroxene composition of ordinary chondrites. So here we have more than 6,000 points, and you see that we have different types of ordinary chondrites. And uh, by, by analyzing the minerals, we can learn, we, we can classify meteorites. So by mixing all of these methods. But here we developed a, a classification method, which was only based on microscopic studies, petrographic data, and also using magnetic measurements. So there was no need to do mineral chemistry analysis, because we learned that we, we, we can get very precise classification by this methodology. In the other uh, by, by in the other works which are involving, involving working the, uh, on the mineral chemistry, it takes a long time to classify meteorite. Here, by, by to reach this number in classifying meteorites, 708 meteorites, they were classified during this work, and 
as you see, the majority of them, they're ordinary chondrites. Also, we had meteorites, carbonaceous chondrites. And this is the source of the meteorites which were classified in this work from Chile, from Iran, from Oman. Maybe you ask that why it's important to classify this number of meteorites and specifically these ordinary chondrites. Because uh, as I'll show you in the other chapters, by working on very normal looking meteorites, we can, we can find very unique meteorites that we are not really expecting. And besides that, we can have a good uh, database to study the weathering of meteorites in the desert and also by to finding uh, big strewn fields in desertic areas. Besides these classification methods that we used, I used XRD analysis, I used the Mosbar spectroscopy, major trace element analysis, oxygen isotopic analysis, and uh, infrared spectroscopy, Roman spectroscopy, carbon-14 analysis and also cosmogenic nuclides analysis in different labs in the, in the world. So the other part, I'm going to give my results about the meteorites from Lut Desert in more detail. So uh, as I mentioned about Lut Desert, this is a satellite image of Lut Desert and this is a geologic map of Lut Desert. The focus of these studies in Lut Desert were in this specific uh, uh, the structure is called kalut, which are corridors made of silt and, and sand and also clay. And the majority of meteorites that were found in these areas in kalut structure because it's more closer to the road as well. And also there were some meteorites from this area in the Rige Yalon area, which is Tantun. So I'll give you more insights about this. Focusing on the kalut structure, this is kalut structure from from the air, like if we go uh, 50 meters above the, the, the ground, we can have this kind of uh, view to the Kalut structure, which is the focus of this study and the, the highest number of meteorites from this area. This map is showing the meteorite which have been found in the Lut Desert. So before studying this, before, stu before starting this study, there was only uh, almost one meteorite, possible meteorite from the Lut Desert. And now we have hundreds of meteorites from Lut Desert because of this study, so uh, more meteorites being found. And as you can see, the, the location of the majority of these meteorites, they are in the northwestern side of Kalut structure. And in the other part, I'm going to talk about more details of what type of meteorites are these uh, meteorites from Kalut. So these pictures are showing the, mo the, the, the two most abundant meteorites from the Lut Desert. We have H5 meteorites, which are type, all meteorites from Lut Desert uh, so far are ordinary chondrites. So we have H5 meteorites, these guys, and also we have L5 meteorites from the, from the Lut Desert. And when we do the microscopic study, these are the microscopic pictures of these two meteorites. So here we have H5 meteorites. This vein, this vein are made of iron oxides and hydroxides, and it's because of the weathering of the iron inside the meteorite. And here we see that there are less veins, so this meteorite is less weathered than the other one. So two major types of meteorites we found in the Lut Desert. What it tells us, we see that th th there are plenty of hundreds of samples from Lut Desert, which are H5. They are so similar to each other in different areas, and when we plot the coordinates of these meteorites, we see that indeed H5 samples, we, we think they are paired, indeed they are paired. It means that they are related to one meteorite fall event. And also we have another cluster of meteorites in this area which are, uh, I said. So at the end, by looking, by working on this meteorite, we discovered two main storm fields in the Lut Desert, two main meteorite fall events in the Lut Desert that has happened. Focusing on the meteorites from H5, uh, uh, strewn fields because they are the most abundant meteorite. By, by plotting the, 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 the distribution of meteor these meteorites based on their mass, so the bigger the circle is, the bigger the mass is. This is one of the ways to, to investigate the, 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 pass the, 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 the way this meteorite has entered the Earth's atmosphere, the trajectory of a meteorite. So here, here we see that they, they are they are not they doesn't they don't show any specific pattern. So it means that the the, the result that we got from here is that the the entry angle of this meteoroid to the Earth's atmosphere was very high. That these meteorites they don't show any specific uh, 
uh, pattern, so they, they are just, uh, they don't show any specific in this part, we, we learned that we discovered two main strong fields, and one of them is this H file that we have studied this in, in very detail. The other part, uh, I will talk about from hot deserts. So this is an example of a meteorite from Lut Desert. It's called Lut 9, it's an H4 chondrite. And when you cut a meteorite, you see that there are areas which are orange and red in color. So it's because of the presence of iron oxides and hy hydroxide. It's because of the presence of rust in general. So when these meteorites they fall to Earth, the metal starts to get rusted. So we started to study these weathering processes in meteorites. Why? There are different reasons. One of them is that meteorites are the sources of studies about the formation of planets and the other cosmic chemical works. So by documenting the weathering of a meteorite, we, we can avoid the misinterpretation of the data that we get from meteorites. For instance, if we study a meteorite and we know the, uh, the effects of weathering on meteorites, we can avoid those data. Uh, besides that, it was interesting for us to study the, the process of weathering in general. And besides that, we were also interested to see the effects of climate on the weathering of meteorites. So this picture is showing uh, another uh, meteorite from the Lut Desert, but it's in a microscopic scale. So here you see that the inner part of a meteorite is showing these white dots, which are iron, pure iron. And when we go outside of the section, it, it's been weathered, and it's because of the weathering. But why the meteorites, they are weathered in the Lut Desert? Because in general, they are very old meteorites. To learn that how much is the age of these meteorites, when they have fallen to Earth, or how much is the terrestrial age, we did carbon So here we have ages which are in the order of 10 to 30,000 years. So these three meteorites, they have fallen in the order uh, between 10 to 30,000 years, which is in the range of the terrestrial ages for the meteorites from, from the old deserts of the world, except Atacama Desert that is, is, is more, the meteorites are in general 10 times higher older than these meteorites. So to study in detail the, the effects of weathering on meteorites, uh, first we start with the effects of weathering on the mineralogy of meteorites and we investigate it by using the magnetic susceptibility. So this, uh, this chart, uh, this plot is showing the magnetic susceptibility and the weathering rate of a meteorite. M the more, uh, the, the, in this side we have the increasing of the weathering rate. And this dot is showing the, 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 the magnetic susceptibility of an L chondrite which is fall, which hasn't been weathered. When we plot the data for Atacama Desert, we see that during the weathering of a meteorite, its magnetic susceptibility is decreasing because more metal is turning to oxides and hydroxides, which are not magnetic. And when we do this for Omani meteorites, the meteorites from Oman, we see that they are also showing the same behavior. But uh, as we see in this part, apparently it shows that the rate of the decrease in the magnetic susceptibility for Omani meteorites and Atacama meteorites, it, it is different. So they are showing different trends. So the meteorite uh, weathering, at least in their mineralogy, is different between different deserts. So what about We see that the meteorites from Root Desert, when they start to get weathered more than weathering grade two, their magnetic susceptibility it increases. And it's because of the formation of minerals such as magnetite and machimite, which are magnetic. So it is showing a different trend. So we see that weathering in different, weather, uh, in different deserts, it's showing a different behavior. When we plot the data of XRD and Musbar spectroscopy for total oxides, which are the oxidation pro uh, products of meteorite weathering, it's, we see that there is a negative correlation between the silicate and the total oxide. It means that not only the metal and troilite iron sulfide, but also silicates also, they start to decrease during the weathering of meteorites. And when we look to the, to the abundance of uh, oxides in different deserts, again, so this green uh, points that are showing the meteorites from Lut Desert, and these are the meteorites from the Atacama Desert. We see that in general, the meteorites from Lut Desert, they are more weathered than the meteorites from the Atacama Desert, which is uh, the, uh, the, the, the more humid history of this desert. Lut Desert is responsible for it, so meteorites are more weathered. 
So uh, as we saw, loot materials that are showing higher oxide abundance than those from the Atacama. In this graph, uh, as we can see, the, um, the abundance of makimite, uh, which is one of the uh, products of terrestrial oxidation of a meteorite, it is showing that during the weathering of a meteorite, we have an increase in the amount of this, uh, this mineral, which is one of the controllers of the amount in a meteorite. But besides the mineralogy changes during the weathering of meteorites, when we look to the amount of uh, it, the changes on chemical composition, for instance here, uh, this is a graph which is showing the increase in the temperature of, uh, and also the weight loss in a meteorite. So it is showing that how much, met, uh, how much uh, uh, we have loss in ignition, how much volatile phases we have. Here, this graph is showing a fall meteorite and the other ones are showing desertic meteorites. So it shows that during the desertic uh, weathering of meteorites, we have an increase in LOI contents of meteorites. This is also reflected in the abundance of carbon. But when we focus on the meteorites from loot desert, here uh, we have the meteorite, different meteorites, fall meteorites, the abundance of carbon from fall meteorites, the abundance of carbon in meteorites find in different deserts, and these are the data for loot desert meteorites. When we compare it with the others, we see that the meteorites from loot desert, they have more total carbon in their composition. Meteorites from the other hot deserts and also from the, uh, from the falls. And when we, uh, when we plot the abundance of total carbon to the calcium carbonate for the meteorites from loot desert, we see that we can see the difference here easily by looking to this side, which is these, these uh, white uh, uh, squares that are showing meteorites from the Atacama Desert and Sahara Desert, but the other ones are the meteorites from Loot Desert. You see that the meteorites from Loot Desert, they, are, they have more total carbon, and the main responsible for it is the abundance of cal calcite in these meteorites. So we see that the meteorites from the Loot Desert, they have more carbon calcite in their structure, and it's because of the, the abundance of calcium carbonate, which is increasing the amount of total carbon in this meteorite. So we see that in tree and specifically uh, uh, total carbon content, meteorites from different deserts, they are showing also different behavior. When we look at the so this is a spider from compare to the composition of a fall meteorite, a meteorite that has not been weathered. So this one is showing the, the standard. You see that there are different enrichment and depletions. Lithium, strontium, barium, uh, different other elements which are showing an increase in their chemistry. It means during the weathering of a meteorite, the, 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 the abundance of these elements, they are increasing in a meteorite. And also some elements such as the chromium and cobalt, they start to decrease. It's because of the, the oxidation of So they, they go to the soil from the meteorites. But what we can learn from this, when we plot the and barium contents in meteorites from different deserts, we see that these meteorites from Oman and also loot, compared to the meteorites from Sahara Desert and the Atacama Desert, they are more strontium rich. And it is because of the presence of high calcite in the soil of these, these deserts. So as you can see, by using these data, we can even, by, by analyzing a meteorite, we can learn that where this meteorite is coming from. So we see that the meteorites in different deserts, they are showing also different chemistry, not only different uh, mineralogy. And when we plot the abundance of REEs. So here this plot is showing the abundance of REEs, rare earth elements, in the soil from Loot Desert and from Atacama Desert. And this is the abundance of the, 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 the thick line, is the abundance of these uh, elements in the fall meteorites. And these, the other lines are the desertic meteorites. Here, as we see, there is an increase in the abundance of LREEs in the hot desert meteorites. So when the meteorites, they start to get weathered, the, the abundance of LREEs, light REEs, they start to increase. So during the time, they start to be similar to the soil, and at the end, they become 
when we plot these data, so this is the showing the lantanium to lutetium uh, contents. So we see that here, the one is showing for, for fall meteorites. So we see that in general, all of these meteorites, they have higher lantanium to lutetium. In the fall meteorite, it should be one. But in the other ones, we see that there is an increase in the abundance of these. So it shows that during the weathering of a meteorite, meteorites. Uh, it is also important because we see the meteorites from the the, 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 the red points are meteorites from Atacama. They are showing more fractionation from the meteorites from the loot desert. So in part, we the secondary meteorites. Higher and the Atacama Desert meteorites, as you saw in the previous parts, they, they are less weathered, but still they are showing high. We theorize that that's because of the uh, because of the, the the slow rate of weathering in the loot, uh, in the Atacama Desert, the, these meteorites they have more opportunity to get. History has more time to get modified. So. If a meteorite is, doesn't show a weathering in a, in, a, in a microscopic section, it doesn't mean that it's not uh, weathered chemically. So it, it, this is one of the importances of this work that shows that the people who are on deserts, they should, they should avoid meteorites from different deserts. They, first of all, they, should really, uh, they shouldn't really trust on the chemistry of meteorite by only looking to the unweathered nature of a meteorite. This talk, as I mentioned before, by in, in the desert, in the meteorites from hot deserts, only normal-looking meteorites. The people, they, some people, they, they don't classify these meteorites because they think that they are just some normal meteorites. But among these collections of very rusty, badly-looking meteorites, we may find very important meteorites as well. So, one important meteorite is this is small 16 gram fragment which was found in Atacama Desert in 2013 by Professor Pierre Rochette. And at the beginning, it was looking like a normal, ordinary chondrite, so a, a very weathered ordinary chondrite. So this is a microscopic view of this meteorite. So more work right, is showing, for instance, more magnesium-rich olivine. And part we, we saw that the structure of iron, this is an iron grain in this meteorite, is showing very weird structures that we haven't seen in other meteorites. We learned that the pyroxene content of this meteorite, here the green uh, grains, is more than olivines. In ordinary chondrites, the, 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 the most common, the most abundant uh, uh, mineral is olivine, but here it was a pyroxene, so it's showing that it's some. So we did the mineral chemistry analysis, as I told you, one of the, uh, in the beginning in classification part, one of the things that we used, the chemistry of olivine and pyroxene. So we did the analysis to see that which part of this graph we have. We were expecting that it's going to be like somewhere here because magnetic susceptibility was very similar to these eight chondrites. But it was surprising. Here, this meteorite is completely away from the other ordinary chondrites. It is looking like an ordinary chondrite, but its chemistry is completely different. It's an unequilibrated ordinary chondrite, and its chemistry, as you can see, it is like phyolite 4 and ferrocellite 13. So we learned that this is a meteorite, very unique meteorite. It's coming from an asteroid that we, doesn't, we don't have samples, so we were thinking that it's not coming from the ordinary chondrite uh, asteroid parent body, so it's coming from somewhere else. And to compare with the other we learned that there are also other three meteorites that are showing similar characteristics and similar chemistry to this El Medano 301. And we thought that they are showing a couplet here, indeed, they are showing a cluster here. They might be related to each other, or at least they have formed in a, in a very similar conditions in the solar nebula. These meteorites, 
these uh, three meteorites here. I studied two of them in detail as well. One of them is this meteorite called Cumberland Falls. So these fragments that I was, we were, we, it was interesting for us. There are clasts in an uh, in an achondritic meteorite. This one, and this is showing that uh, Northwest Africa meteorite. One of the there are two, three meteorites which are very similar to the to our meteorite, and two of them are these ones. The other way to, in order to uh, to check that if uh, this uh, this similarity is only in the mineral chemistry or also in the other parts as well, we started to do oxygen isotopic analysis of the meteorites. So this chart is showing the oxygen isotopic composition of ordinary chondrites. Here we have H chondrites, L chondrites, and LL chondrites. And the majority of the meteorites that we have in our collections, they fall, again, they plot in this area. But what about the L Medano 301? It is here. It's again, it's different. We were expecting that because of its chondrial size and other things, it might be related to H. chondrite, but it's not. It's completely away. And to check that, what about the other meteorites? What about those two meteorites? They fall here. Cumberland fall class. They fall here. And the other one, fall here. And here as well, we see that these ones, they are again, they are showing one cluster which. So we theorized that this is showing a new grouplet of ordinary chondrites. And until now, we have four samples from this grouplet. And we learned that they are coming from a completely different asteroid than the asteroid, the parent body of ordinary chondrites. To learn which group of, uh, uh, one of the ways to, to, to investigate the link between the meteorites to asteroids is to use the IRS infrared spectroscopy of asteroids and meteorites. So this graph is showing the IR spectra of El Medano 301, the R meteorite. Here it is showing the, 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 the green one is the spectra of an ordinary chondrite. And the red one is the spectra of a basaltic chondrite. And this one is the, for, for an asteroid of V type, Vesta type. And we see that the, this meteorite, El Medano 301, it is showing the spectra of a V-type asteroid because of its higher presence of pyroxene. So indeed, we see that this chondrite is showing a but not uh, the spectra of the meteorite. So to conclude this part, El Medano, uh, together with the other samples, we see that is a representative of a new grouplet of ordinary meteorites. The parent body of this meteorite is a chondritic asteroid, but with the IR spectra of a asteroid. And at the end, also, we see that the classification of even very common-looking meteorites can lead to important discoveries. So more works on on very rusty and very normal looking meteorites should continue in order to find very unique meteorites among them. The other part of my talk, I will talk about two meteorite falls in Iran. Meteorite falls, are, they are very important because the meteorites are very fresh. They have just fallen from space. So this table is showing the meteorite falls in Iran. The first one, uh, which is, we have the meteorite is from 1880s. The other one, 1974. And you, you know, meteorite falls are very rare. But when I started my thesis here at Sarajah 2015, I was too lucky that during one year, with the time dis difference of 40 days, we had two meteorite falls in Iran, just 200 kilometers from each other. So it was very surprising. And also, it's kind of a record. Uh, I, I don't recall any country to have two meteorites in less than 40 days. So I was so lucky to have access to these meteorites as well. So here in, at Sarej, we had uh, these meteorites in almost one of them in two weeks after its fall in our desk in Sarej. The first, uh, first I'm gonna talk this Moshampa meteorite. This is a meteorite, meteor of that meteorite. So the people, uh, thousands of people, they saw this meteor in Iran and the meteorite, it fell in a, in a farm. And then also by, by the team of Sarej, we had the opportunity to go 
visit the area, even though we couldn't find meteorites, but still we had access to this meteorite and we studied it in detail. So these are the pieces of that meteorite that fell, and we have them in Sarajevo as well. So this meteorite, this section, this is a microscopic section. It's showing that it has very low amount of iron and troilite, and the classification result showing is, shows that it's a it's a LL5 breccia. It's an ordinary chondrite of LL5 breccia. The other meteorite, which is a little bit more interesting, this one is also more interesting. Uh, the Moshampa meteorite here. The other one which was very interesting is a meteorite which fell in Famenin town in Iran. And as you see, there was this guy who was resting in house in his house and then like early in the morning, there was this meteorite falling to the roof of the house. We had this meteorite at Sarraj in two weeks. And the classification result is showing, so this is a microscopic view of this meteorite. It, as you see, it's a chondritic meteorite. These are the chondrules. And by doing the mineral chemistry analysis and also the systematics of organic matter, uh, we see that it's a, it's a type three, almost equilibrated ordinary chondrite. But it was showing very strange uh, characteristics that we learned at the beginning uh, when we did magnetic susceptibility measurements. We did that it's showing we, we saw that it's showing an intermediate. Do more analysis. More interested to do more. So. Here, I will show the results of oxygen isotopic analysis. Uh, you, you saw this figure in the, uh, this chart in the previous part. Again, ordinary chondrites, oxygen isotopic analysis. And here, we analyzed uh, the Bremer Verde, which is a intermediate ordinary chondrite. And this is a range of HL chondrites, which are only two meteorites on, in this collection. And see that if our meteorite is an intermediate meteorite, or not. So these are the results for FOME. As you see, it is plotting just next to this primer vorticondrite. And its mineral chemistry, just to let you know, the mineral chemistry is in the range of H chondrites. It is showing very intermediate characteristics. So here I have some uh, classification uh, parts of this meteorite. The average olivine and pyroxene and also grain density of FOMENIN meteorite it's showing that it's an H chondrite. The saturation magnetization and whole rock nickel cobalt content, it's showing that it's an L chondrite. It is showing very intermediate characteristics. As I told you, we have only two meteorites which are really HLs have been described, those uh, Tishitz and Bremer Verde. By looking to the average chondrial diameter, average cobalt content in camasite, which is uh, the iron nickel metal, Metal model abundance, magnetic susceptibility, whole rock oxygen isotope composition, it is showing, a intermedi it's showing that it's intermediate between H and L chondrites. So we did a study of the other HL chondrites, other uh, intermediate chondrites, and we learned that we think that uh, among all the meteorites which have been known as HL chondrites, that in the, in the meteoritical Bolton, which is the source of we see that among the intermediate chondrites, only nine of them, they are really intermediate HL chondrites. And we propose HL for these new chondrites. And we think that this is a new group of ordinary chondrites. So we have HL, LL, and also intermediate HL chondrites uh, can be used as a new uh, designation, a new group of ordinary chondrites. So to conclude my, my talk, this work, uh, is a very suitable place for meteorite f conservation, accumulation, and searching. So it's a very promising area for more meteorites. So we have discovered a new place, which is a good source of meteorites, not, uh, very new meteorites, which can be used in different studies. We learned that two strong fields, they occur in, the, in, in Lut Desert H5 and L5. We learned that hot desert weathering of meteorites it is changing the mineralogy and chemical composition of meteorites, and it is different. It is acting as different in different ways in different regions of the world, in different deserts of the world. By working on the Lut Desert meteorites, which are showing more uh, weathering than the meteorites from the Atacama, for instance, we learned that this, this desert has had a more humid climate in the past than in, in present time. 
about the uh, El Medano 301, that unique meteorite. We, it's an ungrouped meteorite, which has formed the nebular region, which is more related to, in, in chemistry, it's related to ordinary chondrites. But it's, showing, it's showing that it has formed in an area with lower oxygen fugacity. And it is a different group, it's coming from a different grouplet of ordinary chondrites. We show that this, uh, this meteorite is a chondrite, which is showing spectra of V-type asteroids, which are believed to be basaltic. And also we suggest that this three other meteorites are members of a unique group of ordinary chondrites. And in the end of conclusion, Fomini meteorites is classified as a HL chondrite type three, and together with similar intermediate chondrites, means that this this meteorite is showing a new grouplet, and it's coming from they are coming from a separate ordinary chondrite parent body. Ordinary chondrites, and the perspectives of work. For sure, this this work was just the beginning of working on meteorites from. Iran, and specifically from Lut Desert, more works on other deserts should continue, and it has already started, and I'm so happy about that, because more meteorites are coming from Iran, and it's a very good source of more material for us. And more works on meteorites, and these two storm fields, it, it should also give us information about the process of meteorite fall. Working on effects of terrestrial weathering on isotopic composition of meteorites is also very interesting that we did the analysis. I did the analysis during my, my PhD work, but I haven't included the data here. And also working on terrestrial weathering of Antarctic meteorites is interesting that it has also been started. So uh, to compare it with the hot deserts, it's a very interesting topic. And in installing a meteor observational camera network in Iran, it can be very useful to, to detect new meteors and meteorites that three of these cameras has already been installed. So, uh, Thank you very much for your attention. At the end, uh, I want to say a very special uh, thank you to, to Professor Pierre Rochette, my, my supervisor, who, who gave me the opportunity to do this project and who trusted me and who supported me during this time. Thank you very much. So this is showing a, a picture in Iran when we were going in the central desert and this car was broken. And here we have Professor Gunel and Dr. Gatajika who are reading the novel. Very special thank you to uh, Dr. Javon Gatajeka, who supported me during this time technically and personally. Thank you very much. I really appreciate the time. I want to say a very special thank you to uh, all the people in the and all the teams that have uh, worked with. Thank you very much. I want to say a thank you to all the people of the jury. Uh, Thank you very much for accepting to be a part of this work. Well, the, the, the list of people, it, it's very long, but uh, I mean like. And uh, I want to say a very special thank you to Dr. Jamali, who helped me during this time. And, and at the end, I, I want to say thank you to my family in Iran, who supported me during this time and since the beginning. Thank you very much. Yeah, he, I think he was watching because I was doing the live streaming, so I, ga I had gave him the link, so I suppose he was, he was following. Maybe we'll be able to join him? Uh, actually, I have told him to send the questions to, to uh, Pia's email, so yeah.
Et par contre, nous avons un invité iranien, Morteza Jamali, qui est chargé de recherche à l'INDE sur, sur le campus et qui a participé à une partie du travail de terrain avec un autre. Et moi-même, euh, que j'oublie quelqu'un Non, pas euh, Et moi-même, Bertrand Bédois, professeur ici à Chartres l'Université. So I propose we begin with Vincian. Well, thank you, Anne. Um, the presentation was very nice and really impressed. Even better, actually, I'm, I'm a bit jealous because the picture was so nice and even more than the picture. I'm a bit jealous. Which picture? But uh, I would like to, to congratulate you for the work you've done because it was really a multidisciplinary approach to neurology, to chemistry, and you did a lot of science, but even uh, sociopath and cultural in your own, so it was very nice to you, so congratulations for that. Thank you. Um, I don't have that many questions, actually, but I have a few anyway. My question is related to your presentation, but also to your thesis. Uh, on the slide 23, um, why the, the carbon content is so low for the LA coal um, compared to plants? Uh, okay, uh, I want to find this slide to... Sorry. Okay, uh, sorry, you mean here? In this one, yes. you mean? So, for the age, indeed, the plants are more, you know, more enriched in carbon, which makes sense, but not the LA. You mean for the fine meteorites? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, first of all, these are, the, these are not my data, so these are the, the, these ones, they are the, from the literature. So, I think the main reason uh, for, for that, besides the, I think, uh, well, I think one of the, the reasons can be the, the higher rate of weathering for, for aged chondrites, which is making them more, uh, I mean, because of the higher uh, abundance of uh, a, uh, iron inside them, maybe the, the higher rate of weathering, it is making them more responsible for, 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 for absorbing more carbon inside them. But uh, about that, why it's, uh, for instance, here we see that they are very similar but in this case, uh, since they are not my data and for interpretation, I really, I think that th the main reason can be just the presence of, of more weathering or maybe the, these are the things that I mean, like I need to check the, the source or maybe the, the, the majority of the L and LL meteorites that they have used in their study has been equilibrated L6 and things like that. And since in these L6 and high petrographic types, we have lower carbon content as far as I recall. So I think that's one of the reasons. For instance, we, I, 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 I suppose that they have used H3 and this type of uh, H meteorites, but here for Ls, they have used L6 or more equilibrated meteorites, which is decreasing the, the amount. I need to check their, the, the source and the, their sample lists. Yeah. And on another slide, well, 21. 21. Um, on that one, I was wondering if Akatana, they're very much older. Uh -huh. So, can you really compare the alteration between Akatana? Well, uh, well, the fact is that since uh, here, uh, so we have uh, this is a, you know this is the average amount of, uh, diff uh, for instance, this is the average amount of tens of type uh, W three meteorites from Atacama, from Oman, and from different deserts. So based on petrography, they are showing similar uh, petrography. 
So uh, I don't know if I, if I could say wh what I mean. Uh, for, for meteorites, for instance, here from the Atacama, we have used here the W3s from Atacama, W3s from Oman, and uh, we know that Omani meteorites, they are younger than the meteorites from the Atacama, but here the only purpose was to see that what is the effect of weathering on the uh, magnetic susceptibility and mineralogy. We see that the meteorites from Atacama and the meteorites from Oman, when they get weathered, they show different mineralogies. For instance, here, we think uh, it means that it, it shows that here, and also we've seen them in lots of meteorites from Oman, at least as far as I recall in, in the petrographic sections, that meteorites from Oman, when they get weathered, they start to show, for instance, magnetite and, and minerals like that. But I haven't seen any magnetite, uh, at least, in, at least in, the, in the section in the meteorites from the Atacama. And also in loot meteorites, we have also plenty of them. At least that's great. Here, uh, I, I let me. Let me I, uh, it's line uh, 1032. So, so you say a decrease in the content of vanadium, chromium, cobalt, and rubidium due to metal oxidation is detected. Eh? Why is rubidium be affected by metal oxidation? So this, this, this thing that uh, I know rubidium has nothing to do with the, with the metallic oxidation, but here I mean by metal oxidation, I just meant the, the, the terrestrial weathering of meteorites, which is representative by the metal oxidation. That was the purpose. I know that rubidium is a, is a lithophile element, as far as I recall. So it has nothing to do with the siderophile elements. But when we have the weathering of a meteorite, it shows that the meteorite rubidium content is decreasing. And I have here, I have just talked about the met metal oxidation, only representative of uh, meteorite weathering. I, I should change uh, yeah, yeah. I, I should change that. I, I know, I know. Yeah, yeah. I, I see your point. But yeah, yeah. You exactly. I mean, it, it works for works for chromium cobalt, which are from the same family as iron, but it doesn't work for rubidium, I think, yeah. And anyway, you will get points from the uh, Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, in your output page, page yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> you missed a bit of everything. It's so, right. it's just a, a math question, but um, it's page 18. For the plot number five? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> For the R2? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. it should be yeah. well, two numbers. Is enough. Really yeah, two <laughs> numbers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was just wondering. Um, also, something at the end of your presentation, the, the reflectance spectra. Well, the fact is that here, uh, uh, first of all, this uh, IRS spectra work has been done by, by Dr. Beck, Pierre Beck. So here, uh, one thing that makes it different from the other 
Belgian contracts, the democracy that remains in India has been some power scene, which is a lot. Here they have individual disputes like this, like in the remote abundance, it's like more than 70 questions. It's completely different, it feels very different from the original contracts. And that's why here it's making this one different city move to the other country. So could it be Bolivia that can control, actually, since we lose Bolivia? So, so I agree it's different from page contract, but I'm not sure it's similar to the okay. uh, <laughs> Because that's the only, uh, as, far as, I, as far as I know, that, that's the only group of main astrotypes which is showing the, 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 the best match. You know about the, the meteorites that we've seen in the Bolton as H slash L and are, are known as H L chondrites. In most of the cases that we, we check the, the literature, uh, I mean we check the meteorites, it means that we are not sure if it's H or L in most of these cases because the, 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 the classification methods, they were only using like the, the magnitude susceptibility. For majority, of the, for majority of them, it's like that. So since they have been already classified and named like this with this group, we are not really sure that if they are really intermediate or they have been misclassified or I mean they are not well classified. That's why we started to, to propose this, uh, to, to this type of designation, which is showing that these guys are really intermediate. And we say intermediate doesn't mean that we don't know H or L. They are really intermediate, that, that's, that's the difference that we make and we, we by checking the all the meteorite lists that we had, there are more than 60 meteorites that have been classified as H, L, H slash L. We see that the majority of them, except nine of them, they are really, it's like, we don't know if it's H or L. For majority of them is like that. You, you know, that, that's why we, we propose this kind of designation to show that, okay, these ones are really intermediate, for instance, tissue, sperm, and organ, and family. Okay, and um, well, I guess you, you didn't, I have read that paper. I have read yeah. that paper. Yeah, I read that paper. But you, you know this this paper that we published about this in GCA. It was before that paper. Mm. It was before that paper. Yeah, I've read that paper. It's uh, it's about this Mondio class HL class in Mondio. Yeah, I, I've read it. It's in maps, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes. Yes, I've read the paper, but our work was already published, so I couldn't go. Uh, yeah, I couldn't cite it. Yeah, yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah, it's very interesting work. It's showing that uh, HLs uh, that uh, we had in, in Yetchaburu and the other meteorites, the, the, the early works of Wasson, this one is also the Mondio. It's also showing that we have this type of things, but it's not very related to El Medano or Three Zero One. It is just. A, it is a reduced ordinary chondrite for that one. If we check, well, I haven't included here, but in my in that article of El Medano 301, we have L, LL, LL, LH, and also we have a tail of H, which is Mundio and Mitsharabu and all of these HH guys there. But here, the, 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 the region that we have, you know, they, ha they are being called as F chondrites. So HLs are different from F chondrites. HL, they are usually five like 12 or something like that. Mm -hmm as far as I recall. So, but they are, they are reduced. So I have, uh, I have cited the works which are related to HLs, but since your work was published later, unfortunately I couldn't cite it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.
calme, qui est aussi la parole au deuxième rapporteur. I think that was the reason, actually, the, I'm, I'm sorry, but during the, the initiation of my work, to be, I, I was active, very active in the media, so I, I made the, the, the public very ready for this kind of things, and when the material just fell, everybody just co corrected me, so I mean, that's, I think, this was fine. Mm -hmm. Okay, I find it uh, very impressive, uh, the last number of uh, classified keywords, around 700 keywords of, uh, by you, um, with your described method. Um, and it's a good thing to show that you already have produced in this relatively short time uh, three peer-reviewed papers already published in the literature on uh, these results and uh, two other manuscripts which are ready for independent publication. I guess. Um, so the number of uh, methods you uh, were using uh, also impressive electron microscopy, electron microprobe, infrared spectroscopy, gamma spectroscopy, and measuring uh, carbon isotopes, oxygen isotopes. It's, uh, it's a really good uh, piece of work in my view. Um, very important is uh, your description and characterization of this ungroup El Medambio 301 meteorite with the uh, reduced uh, uh, meteorite with this interesting uh, reflection spectrum and um, also the uh, description of the family in this right and your interpretation that it uh, represents uh, uh, a new group of uh, ordinary chondrites is an is important um, part of your work. And I must admit that um, until I read your, um, your thesis, I was not convinced that this group exists, but uh, you convinced me that uh, For the majority of the meteorites from desertic areas, since we use only magnetic susceptibility and since we use mostly the weathering grade of meteorite to do the classification, you know, by correlating these two, we only use thick sections to do the classification for most of the ordinary chondrites because it's more faster. But for thin sections for important, I mean, like, uh, all meteorites are important, but for a meteorite, if we want to really focus on and to do more detailed work, we prepare thin sections and then we do some shock stage determination, for instance, for Elmedano, Pamelina, and others. But for the other meteorites, for classification of meteorites, uh, we shouldn't be working on thin sections, which are just, just faster. So then, unfortunately, in that method, we don't have the chance to do shock stage determination, but uh, for only for classification, Um, you also 
let's suppose uh, you stop here um, the classical um, um, classification scheme for meteorites, for the various meteorite groups. Uh, could you imagine um, another uh, type of uh, classification scheme, uh, especially considering a recent result on, on isotope, uh, isotope chemistry? Uh yeah, sure. Uh, for, for most of these classifications, that for, for instance, the cl classification chart that you showed here, also as well, it's, it's, uh, it's been produced by, by mixing data of mineral chemistry by, by, by uh, isotopic forms as well. So we, we do have these kinds of charts that are only classic and isotopic forms. But for, since the, the majority of the classification are, uh, the majority of the meteorites, they have been classified only because of their differences in topography and also the differences in, in mineral chemistry. But for sure, uh, isotopic forms for example, can be included, for instance, uh, I, I'm, I'm thinking that in the future, as we saw in the case of formalin, if we work, uh, if we do a more work, for instance, on the oxygen isotope composition of ordinary compounds, for sure we are going to find different clusters of meteorites. But we need to do more work. And in non formalin meteorites, it is uh, showing us it's just it's, it is it is like a normal ordinary compound. But in our collections of meteorites, uh, if we do more work on, uh, let's say, oxygen isotope decomposition, we will find much more good. Because Pomeni meteorite in mineral chemistry, it was showing that it's just a, a <coughs> H5, it's a, it's a just an H3 meteorite. And most of the people who are doing classification, they are working only in mineral chemistry and texture. But we learned that it's a different thing by using magnetic equilibrium that the people can do, they don't do in their lab. So if we go, for instance, to using isotope, oxygen isotopic composition, uh, determination on meteorites, of ordinary compounds, yeah, I, I'm sure that like among all these thousands of meteorites, ordinary chondrites, which have been classified only in, in three main groups, we will have lots of different clusters, which maybe they are coming from different parent bodies. They have formed in different areas of the world. I assume, yeah, more, more meteorites are, they can be discovered and more groupets and more clusters they can be discovered by doing more work, but the people can have spend more time on the chondrites. I was thinking, uh, uh, with uh, some reach that we have this uh, uh, titanium 50 and chromium 54, uh, and uh, normally let's say if, if we, we detect these both uh, great regimes, the, the carbonist and the non carbonist uh, 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 groups, let's say, and uh, where we have, for example, glucides in the carbonish group and the non carbonish group, which will be a future which yeah. may um, modify this uh, classification scheme which you, which you already uh, presented. So. Yeah. Um, I have uh, another question concerning the slide number 30. Yes, okay. Um, here you can see the, the classical um, um, correlation between uh, cyanide values of olivin and ferrocyanide values in the ferrocy. And although we have Obviously, three different, at least three different uh, asteroids that follow at one trend line. What do you think is the reason that your meteorite uh, in the Danilo is offset of this line? Is this a special primary feature of, of uh, uh, this group, let's say, or is maybe it's a secondary overprint on the parent body? Or what's the well, uh, yeah. uh, well, uh, the fact is that for because uh, for a lot of reasons is that it's going at the Pliocene atmospheric pressure. So because for Pliocene it takes time to get equilibrated, so that's why it's going this up. Otherwise, Olivin has been uh, equilibrated, but for Pliocene, because the diffusion rate is much slower, and this meteorite is like at the end of its life, life three, so that, that, that's one of the main reasons that we use for it. So you would expect if this meteorite would be equilibrated, if you put it in the oven, or let's say, uh, with a very high chemical, would end up uh, at, a, at a point which uh, is uh, also on the correlation uh, line? I think it would, uh, I think if we continue this meteorite to, uh, if, if this meteorite starts to get uh, equilibrated, it's going to be in the same regime of what we have equilibrated. Okay. Um, um, in this meteorite, we also can see um, these reduction rings around the Pleistocene membrane. Um, and sometimes we can see that this um, uh, we have, um, formation of magnesium, which is 
Bukowski occurred along threads. Yes. Can you, can you imagine that this uh, occurred in the nebula, in the brain, um, crystallized somehow in the condor or not, and then get the, uh, received the threads, and then reacted with, the, let's say, the releasing agent or whatever? Well, uh, well here, uh, as, as we saw those uh, rigorous stories for the second part of the scene, we tend to think to our mind that it is maybe nebula in the brain level, or it is maybe entire body. So entire body, we thought it's not, it's, it's not made, because entire body, in order to do this kind of thing, you need to have very high temperature. And this meteorite hasn't experienced very high temperature. So it came to our mind that it has happened in solar nebula. And actually, uh, river storing in Holocene has been observed in conjurals a lot. The people who are working on conjurals, they, they have described the, this kind of river storing that you have the production of these grains in the beginning, let's say for this, and then you have an injection of a reducing phase, for instance, the, the carbon uh, rich phases, mm -hmm. and then the second uh, pompage of this material, it makes these material, uh, these grains to be So for, for which? Uh, yeah, for beryllium, uh, the name is chromium. You have heard all the various half chromium bases are on the right here to the uh, ordinary chondrite. Is this a sampling artifact? Maybe well, not representative sample? Well, the fact is that uh, we've, been, uh, we've analyzed different uh, portions of this material in different calibers. So but it, it's, I think it's not made by an analysis of the material. So it might be real. But that is it related to something special? Uh, uh, I don't know. But it seems to be significant in this uh, figure. Yes. Think yes. About okay. I don't know if it's if it's related to. to no, I don't know because it, it doesn't show in the mineral chemistry or other things. So I, I mean, okay. I mean because it is it, this uh, this specific analysis. Uh, they have done several calculations and it showed the same pattern. Thank you, Amen. I'm very pleased to be here. I remember when I took this time with you and it's very wonderful. Two AM three years ago and uh, the trip uh, two trips we went together and, and very excellent friendly and dedicated host. Thing. We have done a lot of classification, which is, as Joanne said, like very useful. It needs to be done. And this led you to discover a new group of compounds, which is a good group of number of uh, important uh, tool. And uh, thanks to all that work, we also learned to meet the group. And we are now a very good connoisseur. I think it would be very interesting if John would be very helpful for the time and for the community. And um, I have a few questions. Uh, first, I would like to go back into the depth to the Vesta detail. I think Marcian has already spoiled. 
Yeah, so the, 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 thing, the, the thing is, I, I know, but the thing is here we say that uh, all B types, they're not necessarily basaltic and they're not necessarily parent bodies of our guys. Because although we have chondritic meteorites, they are showing similar patterns, IR spectra to this one. So some B type asteroids, they might be chondritic because we have chondrial, we have chondrites which are showing similar spectra. Yeah, good. Yeah. <laughs> I think in a way it shows a little bit to the mutation identifier. Well, but we need only the one spectrum. Yeah, but it was only one. But maybe more, uh, in a way, in a more precise way. And also, if I remember well, when the link was done between two guys at the table, and all of that.
there's a there's a possibility of presence of a crater. Uh, so, I mean, it's tricky because of the heat. Okay, but even though it's too cold, I know it's like it's probably pretty cold, but still the age can be done. And how how would you explain that there is there is no distribution similar to the one we find? So we have this kind of nice sorting in mass, but I think here we, are, we, we think that it derives it's because of the higher angle that doesn't make this kind of distribution that we have for the other ones, and it's not really, and also it's not related to the, you know, disturbance by later phenomena like a flood or things like that because it's, it's a very uh, empty physical area. So the, the only thing can be it's the the only thing that is just by a very high angle of vision. But, but then is it explained in the atmosphere? You should not have got the crater. Uh, if this is not an atmospheric experiment. Yeah, if, if it's, uh, I, I, I told, uh, there's a pro possible presence of a crater. Uh, uh, here, the, the fact is that I'm not sure even that it's, uh, it has, it is because of the explosion in the atmosphere. I mean, like, uh, when we, for instance, uh, and, okay, so the fact is that the fact that maybe there will be a crater is that because of, made because of the uh, impact of, uh, not an, we are not talking about an explosive crater here. I was here mostly talking about a crater made by a bigger, uh, bigger meteorite that just sank in its orbit. You know what I mean? Like, a, mostly like a pit. Yeah, that's like yeah, exactly. Not not an explosive, uh, not, not, not an explosive one. A possibility, I, I would say. And uh, also, I was uh, wondering to argue for the H uh, mm -hmm. uh, group, you mostly can you go back to the experiment for H L, right? Yes. Well, it's been, uh, I showed here only to, to I, I just here focused on oxygen isotope to just show, but here the arguments that we have, uh, metal abundance is one of the most important things that we have. Metal abundance is really between H and L in, in this meteorite. Metal abundance is one of the most important ones. And also oxygen isotopic composition is showing also as well. So we measured oxygen isotopic composition in, in this HL meteorites to compare them with the mineral chemistry and we see that in, uh, uh, in contrast to the other, for instance, H chondrite, it is showing the different oxygen isotopic composition. But it's not only dependent on mineral, on oxygen isotopic composition, it is mostly on magnetic susceptibility and the other things that here uh, I have mentioned. So after working on all these aspects of a meteorite, we can, we can find out if it's uh, HL chondrite or not. I don't know if I, if I could answer it. In a and what do you think to, to, to get to know more of this uh, meteorite? What do you think we could learn from, of this uh, some processes? So, so for instance, one of the things that it comes to my mind that why uh, we have this gap in H L between H and L? What's the reason for this gap? It, was it really a gap 
in the solar nebula or like or like we didn't have this kind of gap and still we have the samples from that area. So maybe finding the sample can really help us to, to see that if we do have this kind of gaps in the solar nebula in the chemistry of asteroids or no. We we really have like gaps like this. And and the reason for the presence of these gaps are also important. So, um, yes, it's a, it's a very special moment for you to see me giving this very good details. It's a big bird cry, but I'm very good at it today. Uh, and I'm also impressed, like uh, the other members of the committee, like the amount of work you have done. And uh, it's even more work that uh, was discovered in the, in the presentation here, when, when we know that uh, actually all the police questions were made by our first. No technical staff to do that, so that's just to give you an idea of how much dedication and attention I never put into his, his uh, PhD. So, my question is uh, I cannot remember why we did not measure the first big ray of the ray of Omega Nova 201. Because the, okay. <laughs> would that be a good idea and why and why did we do this? Yeah, the, 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 the thing it was interesting for us, we were thinking that. That how much is the how much is the exposure edge of this meteorite, and the, the one reason was that the, there was a need for more material. One reason, and the other reason was that there was no opportunity to do that because we we, we, we contacted them. I'm not sure. Uh, for, for them, I'm not sure this, so. And there was a need for a high amount of material. One knows that. I think that was the main reason. And only the Yeah, th we were thinking about doing it with argon argon, as far as I recall, to see that if it's related. I mean, it's it's a very interesting thing to do if it's related to H, L, or no. It's completely different exposure age. But we even contacted them. Uh, one of them is that there was a need for more material, and the other one also no time for analysis, as far as I recall. And uh, the second so you say that if you kind of continue to have the parallel terrestrial diameter between H, H, L, 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 so that maybe, do you think maybe even in the L population there could be different asteroids? And what would be a good way to test that? Sure, uh, I think like uh, one, one of the ways to, um, for sure th th there are ways to do it, and they are more expensive, more time. One of them is to, do, to use oxygen isotopic composition. One of them would be interesting. The other way is to do exposure age uh, measurements on almost all meteor a big a big group of meteorites to see that if they are showing the same uh, collision age or not, then it, it mi they might be related to different parent bodies. Yeah, maybe even in the Uh, 
Well, the fact is that one, for, so you know, in the data there are four equilibrated ordinary chondrites. So the, the, the thing that we see two populations here, it was so interesting, but the fact is that it's because of the classification methods that they use. So in the bulletin, the, 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 the analysis that we have for the meteorite, especially for Antarctic meteorites, as far as I remember, that, that the reason that it's forming these two groups, these two populations, it's not, it's not a real thing as far as I recall. Yeah. What is the, the method with the refractivity? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, because they give uh, fire light by uh, the number, so it's 19 or 20. So you have a uh, log for 19 and log for 20 and log for 21. <laughs> <laughs> but then, <laughs> for uh, for LLs also, it might, it might be uh, the same thing, which is producing this. Yeah, that that's because of the, the high number of samples which have been analyzed by this way, by JSC team and also by, I mean by the team of the Antarctic meteorite classification, since they are using this oil thing, oil emission. That's the reason. It's a. Uh, it's not real. From this graph, you could see we have a whole continuum with many found bodies between the different groups. Yeah, from this uh, from this graph. Yeah, I mean like from this graph. But like, the fact is that at least until the time uh, we, th the things which have been known are L, LL, and L, and also some maybe LLL, that maybe they are coming from different planets. So this is the thing. So, but the fact is that here, this gap that we have, it's much more sharper than the gap from here we have. So, so that's why it came to our mind that why we have this gap. So it's, uh, uh, and also why we have these gaps here, like for instance with anisotide chondrites. So, but, but the fact is that we, th there is a bias in, in having samples from asteroids to Earth. So. No, I agree, that's why we should keep on testing that. Yeah, more meteorites because I mean, like, uh, at least uh, I don't see any point, like, to, like, why we should have this type of gap between insulated chondrites and ordinary chondrites, and nothing is feeling between them. Yeah, the, the vinonites and things like that, they are feeling in between, but maybe we, we just don't have enough samples in our collection, in our terrestrial collections. It's just bias paid. Problem with the 
from the Greek into the specific theme of physics. And the second piece work is what uh, founded by the Iranian uh, National Institute for Ocean Geography, we have uh, the research facility at that time in, the, in this uh, Antigua Gulf. And I was really thankful because probably that, that second uh, piece work was uh, the beginning of this issue in the Sudan comics, which, which wants to get all these sites for uh, nuclear collection. So the second piece work it was very good, and it was for two purposes. Uh, one of them was uh, for Hamas, for nuclear collection, and the second one was for myself and uh, my uh, colleagues, the environmental studies, because this uh, desert of Luz is very interesting in, in, in say, the climatic point of view. These are it is situated in an area which is very susceptible to have uh, been affected by the early Holocene monsoon uh, precipitation. So today it is probably one of the driest uh, deserts in the world, but who knows, probably at the beginning of the Holocene, it was also inside the ice, the famous ICC gate, and it was uh, more humid than today. So some of the aspects, I know that there is in your comment, but some of the weathering uh, features that you are that are different, that make different, differentiated your nuclear from other uh, deserts, probably is related to those to the climatic uh, story. We have some very good operations at the same time that Hamas was uh, collecting samples for micrometeorites and finding good places for future collection. We could have some uh, four samples, and some of them are old enough to inform us about the, the climatic story of this. And uh, something in the future which would be very interesting to uh, see if that hypothesis of the green Middle East and green, green blue is correct or not. And then we can compare to the other. So I have just uh, one question. Uh, how do you see the potential of uh, loose meteorites for say, the climatic reconstruction? Can they inform us about uh, what happened in this loop? And what techniques do you suggest you propose to? Degree with the 
a friend named Rod in Brown University on the psychology of volcanic rocks from the from the north west of Ireland. But he was also very interested in meteorites and he was uh, an amateur astronomer and very active in that field. So he got interested in the meteorites and they were starting to come from Luke. So there were just a, a handful of meteorites that were have been found in the Luke Desert and were starting to be studied in different labs. In fact, the first lab to classify the Luke Desert meteorites were in Munster and uh, also in Bern. And so, um, uh, Hamed and Hassan uh, submitted two abstracts to APSC and uh, Metrop. So the first abstract was in March 2013, and this abstract was describing uh, Luke Desert as a possible place to look for meteorites. And uh, the conclusion of the paper was that they were asking for international collaboration to help them study these uh, meteorites. Uh, myself has been dreaming of working in Iran for a long, long time. I think it was my thesis advisor spent a uh, uh, long time in Iran during Shah period and he told me that it was a fantastic place and fantastic geology and fantastic people. So I said, well, that's an occasion. We just uh, finished a, a, a work on the Atacama Desert, or the PhD on the Atacama Desert where we form the first Syrian uh, expert in meteorites, Milat Darren Zola. And uh, I thought well, it would be maybe a good idea to try to have a PhD thesis on Iranian meteorites with an Iranian guy. And uh, this guy, he, from the abstract, looked a uh, good occasion. And so I contacted Hassan and Ahmed. Hassan told me, well, there in two months there is this uh, for uh, proposal for exchange fund, the British, British Admiral PhD fund to apply for that. So it was in like, uh, June. Uh, in December, we heard that we got funded for this exchange fund. And the next step was to present me to do a thesis. So I asked Ahmed if he would like to make a thesis. And he said, of course, yes. And we applied for a thesis grant to the French Embassy. And uh, in uh, early like spring 2014, we got the okay, we, we can give you a grant, but it was only 18 months grant. Because France is uh, has a big ambition in co international collaboration with that uh, little money. So <laughs> what they do is if, if the, and the, the amount of the grant per month is very low, and it's only half uh, thesis. So it's okay if the thesis is, is shared, but uh, there was no way to share the, the work on meteorites uh, with Bern. It was, uh, it was not, not, especially Hassan Yonazad was going to the USA at that time. <laughs> it was not practical for him also to be part of the joint thesis. And so we started with uh, Let's try to make a full-time thesis in Ferrari with one and a half year of uh, salary. And that, um, that's not, I'm not very proud of this. But um, Hamid managed somehow. It's uh, it one good point of him. We found a few months of extra grants uh, in different, uh, different sources, but it was not very satisfactory. So hopefully Ahmed was very fast. So he arrived in December 2014, so three years and two months before now. And he, he, after that three years and two months, he, he, he began his, his work. And this is already a great achievement. And the other people have looked at the achievement and the uh, particularity of the, the thesis, so I won't insist on it. But yeah, I think. And one point I, I forgot is the, uh, the, the, the role of, um, of uh, Morfeza Kamali, who visited you during uh, that year, 2014, where we were thinking of uh, hiring you as a PhD. 
And uh, when he came back, he uh, had uh, found me in there, and he said, well, you should have proved to yourself this guy uh, PTSD, and you won't regret it. And <laughs> it was a good advice. And um, so thank you, Mo uh, Moy, for that. And thank you very much, Hannes, for the huge work you have done. And also, of course, it's not seen in, uh, in the defense and in the manuscript, but those who need to write from Iran, the souls and the signs, they don't come to you like the, uh, you raise your hand and they, they need to write from you. You spend a lo lot of time uh, typing and sending me a message to people to, to uh, discuss with them and so that they, they send you their need to write. Really, you don't pay for those need to write, but you managed to have all those uh, Iranian people trusting you and sending you to write to, to work on it. That's, that's, uh, that's fantastic. So from a handful of you to write from the unknown uh, at the starting of the series, now we are, we are more than 200 uh, Iranian need to write classified, mostly by you. And uh, we hope that uh, in the future it will go on. So we only not the successful part of the series was the, the exchange, of course, we wanted to visit the new desert, uh, not only, not especially to tell us new but to work on the, the geology of that desert, the geomorphology, what is, because for example, these canyon formations, nobody knows what it is. Nobody knows the age. Is it, uh, some people say it's a paleolay, some people say it's paleozoal, uh, it could be Miocene, Pliocene, Pocomary, nobody knows. And it's, it's very important, I think, uh, to do that. And, and so seriously, um, the French embassy forbid us to go there. And um, so we went two times in, in Iran, but we are not allowed to approach Jews. And we hope to do that in the very near future. But asking the French embassy the permission. And uh, we have nothing about that thing. And uh, so that's my only regret with the series, but otherwise I'm, I'm very happy that you come to the front of us to do the return. And thank you again. So now I will uh, uh, put forward the, the comments of uh, my colleague uh, Hassan Mirza. He's now in his office uh, so late, late in uh, Iran, uh, but he sent me comments. He told me that he had difficulty to follow the defense in screen because the steps that he followed. And mostly he read your, the manuscript, and he was very impressed by the high quality research that you have achieved in the study of the right from Akasham and you. And so here are his questions. So I'm taking a uh, so Hamed, in your slide, uh, you see it in Moxie, in the loop, you to write uh, to weather in weather and grade higher than uh, WG3 to the formation of secondary magnetic minerals. So could you elaborate on this and explain how highly magnetic minerals can control during uh, the, the strongest weather? Thank you. 
specific character of meat with respect to that or what is it? One of the interesting characters in the evolution of meat is that uh, uh, one of them is kind of that it's much uh, younger than the other half of it, especially uh, from the other half of it. And it's showing that in the near past, that we don't have two thousand years ago, there was no meat compared to the other two thousand years ago. Well, I mean, but I was wondering about the temperature. Is it in the earth and yeah. maybe yeah. 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 a high temperature and then yeah. 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 the low temperature is going to be the Makes sense. So the second question of Hassan is uh, in another chapter you state that the content of modern elements such as liquid, calcium, barium, thorium have increased in weather meteorites relating to fresh samples. But the fact is that thorium is an immobile element, and this is content to not change much in modern. So what, what's your uh, interpretation of that contradiction in standard geochemistry? Well, I think in case of uranium, the label might be... No, thorium, thorium. Thorium. Well, about the thorium, there's a reason that it's more in the meteorite in the weather people, I remember uh, people doing uh, weather and studying in meteorites and so on, sometimes you normalize the thorium because it's a thorium which is just immobile element. Thorium, you have a strong influence. Oh no, that's coming in. So uh, that's the fact from your result yeah. that there is an enrichment in thorium, yeah. less than uranium, but there is an enrichment, and it contradicts with the uh, usual thing in, in people doing weathering that thorium is in them. So yeah. hmm? I, I guess the answer is, is that people are like so poor in thorium yeah. that yeah. they just get contaminated by yeah. the soil. Not a question of mobility, but a question of contamination. Yeah, and last question from Hassan. So you dated three samples for loop as uh, 10 to 13 kilometer uh, terrestrial age, and you suggest that these ages were in range with meteorites from other hot deserts, except Atacama. It should be named with other hot deserts and explain why the uh, 10 to 30 kilometer age range is so common. Well, the fact is that uh, the other hot deserts are so close to the north, that there are other hot deserts for the Sahara, Amoni River, So the fact is that the majority of the meteorites are the stuff that is completely destroyed in Sahara, happens in the other deserts that can be raised up more than. Like a 
So I will conclude with uh, not too many questions already. So I will conclude with I will two small questions. Uh, considering the past record of Israel causing in Europe, you can see the probability that two fall during the occupation period. <laughs> <laughs> Did you calculate the probability that two meteorites fall in your own field? I don't know the number of people that are going to be able to do this, but they are not going to be able to do this. Yes, Your Honor. I think the people who are going to be able to do this, they are not going to be able to do this. Right, and I think it's almost, it's very rare. It's not really a joke. Do you think there could be some kind of defect because people were more knowledgeable about meteorites? Uh, this is this can be one of the reasons because they are the people they have been more informed but even like besides that I think there hasn't been any big event like big meteorite fall as well during the past time there, there are reports but I think it's not only because the people they are more informed about that yeah they, they, I mean like now after meteorite fall they knew to, to whom they should call so but maybe in the f in the past also there have been meteorite falls, like at least during the last 40 years, that haven't been reported. There, there is a very high chance. But the, the, the thing that I've done, like before coming to France, so I formed a group of people. We were like 20 people, or students. So we were completely checking all the literature in Iran since 200 years ago to now. All the newspapers looking for reports of meteorite falls. And we have found three promising meteorite fall reports even showing the, na the, the name of the place that we have, we have meteorites. But I think, yeah, th there have been meteorite falls during the past that haven't been reported or like th there was no one to work on the meteorite. During the last, I think during the last seven years or something, I, I've, I've traveled almost all Iran to, because like I, I was hearing like they were saying that there is, a, there is a mosque in this village, in this area of Iran, that there is a meteorite there. So I used to go there to these kind of places to see the rock and then to see that it's not a meteorite. So I think more if the people they start to work more, for sure that there, there are more meteorites that have fallen and the people that have seen them. Because it's a vast country, it's a big country, so there is a high chance. I know if I could answer the question or not, like. But like for the for the for the Moshampa meteorite, we had trouble. For the for this meteorite, uh, for Famenin, uh, we had access to meteorite in two weeks. Morteza he brought it here. But like I need to do lots of discussions with the people. We even uh, gave him a paycheck uh, uh, without the amount of the money that, <laughs> that there were people who did for me. They they gave a check to say that okay, if this guy doesn't classify this meteorite, you have to pay this amount of money to this person. So there were lots of things going on. For Moshampa meteorite, police took the samples, and the, the sample was in police. So I, uh, because of the, uh, I mean, like because, of, so I started to to work in the media about that. So we had a big interview in in one of in, in the most famous newspaper in Iran with the title saying that police should give the meteorite to us. So and then they sent the meteorites very easily. So I mean, like. Uh, we needed to do lots of work to, to have access, especially to fall meteorites. It's, it's not very... Yeah, I concur with Pierre that this part of your work is in the end of the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, maybe uh, Hassan told me that now he can hear you very well and he has good connection, so you can say a few words to him. <laughs> maybe in Farsi, so we can hear some Farsi in the okay. Well, I'm not going to say bad things. <laughs> in Farsi. <laughs> so, 
سایه ازشون خیلی تشکر میکنم که خیلی کمک کردن توی این مدت و ممنونم ازشون و امیدوارم که در آینده ارتباطات بیشتری با هم داشته باشیم سو آی سید دت آی وانت سی تانک یو تو هیم اند آی هوپ دت وی گونا کنتینیو اور 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 ریلیشنز ساینتیفیک ریلیشنز ان دی فیوچر وی توگیدر یس اند آلسو ات دی اند آی ریلی وانت تو سی تانک یو تو اول یو ممبرز اف جوری هو هو I mean, like, who accepted to be a part of my jury and to read the manuscript, and thank you, I really appreciate your help. Thank you very much. Okay, merci, donc le jury va faire une petite pause technique. Voilà. Ensuite, ça va être...